Um, the title of my talk is The Rise and Fall of Corporate Sawmills in Montana. The rise and fall of corporate saw milling of lumber followed the historical trajectory of the state and the territorial period through statehood and on into the 20th century. The story begins with the discovery of placer gold at Bannock in 1862, which led to the establishment of Montana Territory in 1864 followed by the discovery of silver in 1866 at Argenta and copper mining in Butte in the early 1880s. The next critical industrial development was the arrival of the Utah and Northern Railroad to Montana in 1880, followed by the Northern Pacific Railroad in September 1883. Railroads created the first national market for industrial products like steel, copper, and lumber, transforming the agrarian nation into an industrial one. Wood products would become an important part of this equation. A critical element of Montana's expanding timber industry in the 1880s would be its connection to transcontinental railroads. In 1880, entrepreneurs Jay Gould and Sidney Dillon punched the Utah Northern Railroad north 110 miles into southwestern Montana from Idaho, and by December 1881 into Butte. Two years later, in September 1883, Frederick Billings completed the Northern Pacific Rail Line from Minneapolis to Portland. On September 8th, the last spike was driven at Gold Creek, Montana, west of Helena. Construction of the Morant Gulch Trestle, the world's largest wooden structure, was completed by the Northern Pacific in 1883. The trestle gained notice reaching a height of 1,226 feet and consuming 800,000 feet of lumber to build. These railways could not be constructed without rail ties, and Montana sawmills and tie hacks responded. In 1884, James J. Hill began construction of the Great Northern Railroad, a transcontinental line connecting St. Paul, Minnesota with Seattle. It arrived in Butte in 1889, which helped establish Butte as the North American capital of copper mining boosting the new state's demand for lumber. The key to understanding the dynamics of the timber industry over the past two centuries is tied to an analysis of two prominent Montana capitalists, Anton Holter and Andrew Hammond. The discovery of gold in Last Chance Gulch in 1864 would lead to the construction of one of Montana's first sawmills at the mouth of Colorado Creek in April 1865 by a Norwegian immigrant, Anton Holter. Holter's fortitude and determination in over six decades in the lumber industry was demonstrated early on when he was shot by George Ives, a notorious outlaw, traveling from Bevins Gulch to Virginia City to obtain parts for his new sawmill. Holter's strength and determination was demonstrated again and again in his work to meet the lumber needs of the struggling placer miners. In 1863, Holter and Evanson transported the territory's first sawmill to Madison County from Denver, Colorado, a distance of 1,000 miles. One year later, the mill garnered $140 per thousand board feet. By April of 1865, Holter operated a mill on Colorado Creek, eight miles southwest of Helena. That same year, Holter established the company of A.M. Holter and Brothers. Each day, Holter commuted between Virginia City and Helena by horseback, rising at 2 a.m. to be at work by 6 a.m. By 1867, Holter purchased a shingle and lath machine, as well as a door and sash machinery from St. Louis. In 1869, Holter erected a new mill on Spring Creek near Jefferson, uh, Jefferson uh, City. By 1870, Holter was operating mills at Wolf Creek, Skelly Gulch, Buffalo Creek, Dutchman, and Stickney Creek. Fire was always an issue in early Montana sawmills, and Holter's sash and door mills succumbed to fire in October of 1879. That did not deter Holter. By 1886, the Holter Lumber Company had seven lumber yards scattered across southwestern Montana. In 1888, A.M. Holter Brothers joined Thompson Lumber to create Montana Lumber and Manufacturing Company. After almost four decades in the lumber business, Holter glad, gladly exited the business in 1898, selling all of his interests to the copper baron Marcus Daly. 
Holter was not alone in following the gold, silver, and copper miners and providing needed lumber for these industries. As of 1869, Montana mills sawed 13 million board feet of lumber, and by 1900, over 200 million board feet. That number more than doubled by 1923 to 427 million board feet. And during the housing boom after World War II, that number peaked at 590 million board feet. Holter's efforts were matched by another Montana timber baron, Andrew Hammond. Hammond was born in New Brunswick to a sawmilling family in 1848, and at age 16 went to work in a main logging camp, working 14 hours a day. In 1867, the Hammond brothers took a steamboat to Fort Benton, Montana, to seek work in the Montana gold fields, but ended up cutting cordwood for the steamboats. By 1871, with steamboat demand for wood shrinking, Hammond headed for Cedar Creek Mining District, but too late for the gold, Hammond made his way to Hellgate and took a job as a clerk with E.L. Bonner, D.J. Welch, and Richard Eddy. In July of 1876, he became a partner in the enterprise to be known as Eddie Hammond and Company, a Missoula Mercantile. By 1900, the Missoula Merc was the largest mercantile between Minneapolis and Seattle. In 1881, the company acquired a huge contract with Northern Pacific Railway for two, 21 million board feet of lumber to build tunnels, bridges, and trestles and to meet demand for rail ties. The Northern Pacific received the largest land grant in American history, which included 14.7 million acres in Montana. By May of 1882, the Hammond Enterprise operated five sawmills along the Blackfoot River east of Missoula producing 20,000 board feet of lumber per day. Hammond was a transformational character, transforming virgin old growth forests into tree farms. This process forever altered the American landscape and the way of life. In the end, the Hammond Lumber Company owned timberlands, sawmills, sash and door factories, railway, railways, shipping lines, and both wholesale and retail outlets. With the arrival of the Transcontinental Railroad, Montana's population jumped from 20,500 in 1870 to 132,000 in 1890, creating a huge demand for lumber. Montana's population would affect the timber industry over time. Between 1870 and 1890, the population jumped again. Um, during that same period, the number of sawmills went from 42 to 100. Montana Improvement Company built the first sawmill in Bonner, the big black mill in 1886, and by 1890, they produced 240,000 board feet per day, the largest mill between Wisconsin and Oregon. In 1898, the copper giant Anaconda, ACM, purchased the big Blackfoot milling company in Bonner from A.B. Hammond and also acquired 700,000 acres of timberland from Northern Pacific Railroad. By 1910, ACM had acquired a total of 1.1 million acres of Montana timberland. Another early mill in Bonner was operated by Stimson Lumber beginning in 1886 and purchased by Champion in 1897. The next three decades saw an enormous increase in lumber production. Between 1900 and 1920, annual production doubled from about 220 million board feet to over 400 million board feet. One of the key players in this story was Minnesota, Minnesota entrepreneur Julius Niels. He incorporated the J. Niels Lumber Company in Sauk Rapids, Minnesota in March of 1895. In 1906, he began acquiring ACM timberlands in Flathead County. In 1910, J. Niels acquired the Dawson Lumber Company in Libby, Montana. In order to meet the challenges of the Depression, Niels built a small box plant. Niels died in 1933, but the Niels family continued to operate mills in northwestern Montana, producing grain doors and poles and posts. In 1957, J. Niels Lumber merged with St. Regis Paper Company. Part of their success can be attributed to selective logging. Two other mills opened in Libby during this period, Dawson Lumber Company in 1906 and Libby Lumber Company in 1914 and Eureka Lumber in Eureka in 1906. 
expansion of the Montana industry ended in 1932 with the beginning of a national economic depression. During the depression, annual production dropped to a little more than 100 million board feet. But with the end of World War II, the demand for housing soared and by 1948, production of lumber reached a new peak of 598 million board feet. In 1946, D.C. Dunham opened a sawmill in Columbia Falls and named Plum Creek after a waterway in Minnesota. The company gained notoriety as the second largest owner of private timberlands in the United States with 7.9 million acres. In 1965, a plywood mill was added. During the 1960s, six plywood mills were opened in Bonner, Columbia Falls, Libby, and Missoula. The uptick in milling created an enormous byproduct of sawdust and wood chips. In 1957, a joint venture between Waldorf Paper Products and Horner Boxes built a mill to transform 4,000 tons of chips and sawdust into 250 tons of pulp daily and 1,000 tons of craft liner board. The 170 employees doubled the mill capacity in three years. By 1968, they employed 438 employees. In 1969, Evans Products of Portland, Oregon constructed the nation's largest particle board plant in Missoula. The post-war boom continued into the 1970s. Production peaked in 1978 with 13,494 workers statewide with the nine largest mills producing 98% of the state's lumber. The boom was largely associated with a variety of new products like plywood, paper, and particle board. By 1972, Plum Creek Lumber operated two sawmills and a plywood plant at Columbia Falls, employing 600 workers in a community of 2,652 people. The use of particle board consumption was increasing at an annual rate of 20%. In 1972, Anaconda sold its Bonner Mill and Timberlands U.S. plywood, and two years later, they became Champion International. In 1993, Champion sold its 867,000 acres of Timberland to Plum Creek and its mills to Oregon-based Stimson Lumber. With the end of World War II and the accompanying building boom of the 1950s and 60s and the subsequent depletion of private forest lands in Montana, came an increased demand for access to federal forest lands. In 1941, the Bitterroot National Forest adopted a plan for annual sustained yield of ponderosa pine on the forest of 7.5 million board feet. In 1969, the Forest Service expanded the cut to 18.3 million, but after 1964, the annual cut of ponderosa in the forest expanded to 25 million board feet. This does not reflect the increase in cutting of all species of all species on the forest specifically between 1961 and 1968. In 1961, that number was 39.1 million board feet, and the next year doubled to 76.8 million board feet. That level of cutting continued uh, going forward with 65.3 million board feet removed in 1968. Directions from Washington to expand the cut affected all of Montana's national forests. In 1968, Montana Senator Lee Metcalf asked Arnold Boley, who was the Dean of the University of Montana Forestry School, to form a committee to investigate forest service practices in the Bitterroot and report back to Congress. After months of research, the Boley Committee published its report and presented Senator Metcalf with a copy. The report describes the problem in detail. I quote, the problem arises from public dissatisfaction with the Bitterroot National Forest's overriding concern for saw timber production it is compounded by an apparent insensitivity to related forest uses and to the local public's interest in environmental values, end of quote. The impact of the Boley report on logging in Montana's national forests was devastating to corporate sawmills in Montana. At the same time, the producers faced cheap Canadian lumber imports, South American imports, a volatile global commodity market, and economic recession. Back in 1961, the Bitterroot National Forest sold 1.2 billion board feet of lumber. In 
by the year 2000, that number had slipped to 114 million board feet. Between 1990 and 2010, 28 major mills closed, severing employment for 2,676 workers. Missoula lost 378 workers in the closure, closure of the two powder mills in 2007, 2008, meant unemployment for 442 workers. The closure of two mills in Libby, uh, Champion International and Louisiana Pacific meant 240 lost their jobs. In 2002, Stimson Lumber closed its plywood plant in Libby and five years later, its plywood mill in Bonner, making for a total loss of 636 jobs. In 2008, Plum Creek Timber closed its plywood mill in Kalispell and one year later, its mill in Pablo. However, the largest loss of jobs can be attributed to the closure of the Smurfit Stone Paper Mill in Frenchtown putting 417 workers, uh, employees out of work. The closure of these corporate mills would have a devastating impact on local economies. The survivors of Montana's small locally owned sawmills like Mark's Lumber in Clancy, RY Timber in Livingston, and Pyramid Lumber in Sealy Lake, which followed the practices of sustained yield. Sustained yield requires selective logging, giving young trees the ability to mature and the replanting as needed. All of these mills are important employers in these communities and will continue to thrive as long as federal timber is available. That's it.